You guys can take a seat. How's everybody going? Oh, we got a great, we got a good. Any fantastics? Oh, front row, Emily, here we go. Oh, it's gonna be a good time in church today. Who has had a wonderful Sunday? Yeah, it's been a beautiful day here in Perth. And wherever you're joining us from all over the world, whether you're just waking up and you're in your bed still, time to get up. God's got a day ahead for you, let me tell you. If you're in a, the previous day because of your time zone, I can tell you the future is bright. <laughs> so I just wanna encourage you today, let's lean in and uh, let's get into the Word today because we're continuing our series called Heroes of Our Faith. Heroes of Our Faith, we've had uh, Sadara talk about Elijah, we've had Brian Harris talk about Jacob and Israel, the same man with two names. And uh, today I wanna continue on that theme. I want us to, I wanna start today. Can, let me start by asking a question. Uh, yeah, go on. All right, let me start by asking you this question. Would you rather look strong and be weak or would you rather look weak but be strong? I hear some murmuring, I hear some muttering. If you're on the chat on Facebook, put in what you would, would you rather, let's put it to a vote. Let's get some hands up in the room. If you would rather look strong, but be weak. How about you put your hand up? One honest person, two honest people. All right, who would rather look weak, but actually be strong? Oh, look at all the spiritual people. Look at them all. I think, you know, I guess it is the right answer, but I mean, obviously, you know, you don't have to choose between the two of those things, and uh, it's not real, it's not gonna be life-defining tonight if you have answered one of those questions a certain way, but, you know, we have people in our church who are so strong. I was thinking we were walking through the foyer earlier to get in here, and I was just amazed at the strength in the room that you would never even know is there. I think of people like the Watson family, so strong, right? I think of all of our business owners and our entrepreneurs who are forging new things. I think of new parents. I think of people who are um, trying new stuff. And I, and I think that there is just such a variety of strength in our church. And you know, we look at our strength and we see, and we see others who are like really self-controlled under pressure and we go, wow, they're strong. You know, we see people who are meeting adversity with like, uh, they're meeting it head on and they're accomplishing something that they never thought they could accomplish. And we go, wow, they are so strong. You know, I personally feel strong when the number at the bottom of the bank account is black and not red. <laughs> we all have a different idea about what makes us strong. And the Bible even encourages us to be strong in the Lord. But what does God think strength is? What does God consider to be strength? And what does he do to get his followers strong? I've been thinking about that. I've been musing about that. And so today my message is called How to Be Strong in God. How to be strong in God. And uh, the heroes of the faith that we're gonna be looking at today, the heroes of the faith we're gonna be inspired by today are called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can find their story in Daniel 2 to 3 in the Bible. And uh, here's the situation. There's three Hebrew men. Their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are Hebrews who live in exile in Babylon. So they've been taken as slaves from Israel. They're now in Babylon. And uh, what has happened is this. The king of Babylon, his name is Nebuchadnezzar because I think this is God's joke on preachers. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar. His name is Nebuchadnezzar and he is as ridiculous as his name. So he has decided that he's going to build a 30 meter high statue of himself probably because he doesn't need local town planning permission to do that because he's the king. And so he builds this ginormous golden statue. He just decides he's gonna do it and he says to the whole nation and to the whole empire, come bow down to this statue and worship it. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to worship the statue because they worship the true God, Yahweh. And they're devout people and they are men of principle. So Nebuchadnezzar is furious because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not just guys in the kingdom. They're not just slaves, they are in the government. They are considered to be wise men. They're considered to be advisors to the king. So the king knows about these guys. He's met them before, he's around them a lot, and he is furious. The Bible says that his face turns purple with rage. Have you ever seen anyone's face turn purple with rage? It's 
Yes? Oh. <laughs> Was it at you? No, okay. <laughs> he is mad. And so because he knows them and he thinks he's a good guy, he says to them, hey, I'll give you one more chance. If you do not bow down and worship my golden statue, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna throw you into a fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so say, we're not gonna do it. They refuse. And so Nebuchadnezzar makes good on his word and he throws them into a fiery furnace. The guards who throw them in die from radiant heat and the three men themselves are bound up with ropes. And then all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar starts coming out and he says, hey, wait, 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 wait. Didn't we throw three men in the fire? How come I'm seeing four men walking around freely and the fourth one looks like the son of God? And all the Christians go, mm, I know who that is. <laughs> it's a crazy, crazy story. Anyway, the three men are pulled out of the fire. They're given a promotion because he is the weirdest boss ever. And Nebuchadnezzar declares that Yahweh really is God. And he says to the whole country who he has just gathered to worship his golden statue, he says, now we're gonna worship this God because I'm seeing that this is the true God. And his exact words are like, I have never seen a God be able to save like this before. And so he, this happens, it's a crazy, crazy story. And you can see why these guys aren't a surprise choice for a Heroes of the Faith theme. I mean, they are so strong. When it comes to standing strong, you don't get much stronger than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So how did they do it? How did they do that? How did they stand strong like that? What did God do in them that he can do in us so that you and I can be that strong? I think the first thing to know is that God wants you to remember your name. You see, when we first meet these three men in chapter one of Daniel, we are not introduced to them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We are introduced to them as Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And these three men have these Hebrew names and their names mean something, but as soon as they are taken into exile, their names are changed. Their names are taken from them and a new name is put onto them. And whenever the, um, these three men are working in the service of God, whenever they're with each other, whenever they are doing God's will, we are, see their names in scripture as Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. When they are being spoken to, when they are under the service of the Babylonian king, they were referred to as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, his name means Yahweh, God has been gracious to me. God has given grace to me. And his name is changed to Shadrach, and that means I've been given by Aku. Do you see the play on words that is happening with these name changes? God has given to me, I've been given to a Babylonian God. Mishael's name is a question, it's a rhetorical question. Who is like God? Who is like God? And he is given the name Meshach, which means who is what Aku is, the Babylonian god Aku. Azariah's name means Yahweh is my helper. God is my helper. And he's given the name Abednego, slave of the god Nebo. And so where God has been my helper, I am now a slave to another God. And every time these names are spoken over them, it's a reminder that they are immersed in a culture that is the opposite of how God wants them to live. Now these men, they never forget their names. You can read in chapter one that they don't lose their identity. These guys are smart, they are committed, they are devout, and so they find ways to stay true to God and excel. And if that's a situation that you can identify with, maybe you're in a workplace that isn't, you know that God wouldn't want you to live that way. And you need to find a way to stay true to God and excel in your work. I'm telling you, it's possible. These guys did it. And they stayed true to their identity. They never lost it. You know, Jesus changed people's names too. Do you remember his disciple, Simon? Simon's name means he who listens. He who listens. And when the disciple Simon listens to the voice of the Spirit about who Jesus really is, he's not just a rabbi, he is the Messiah we've been waiting for, he's the Saviour of the world and he's the Son of God. When he listens, when Simon who listens hears that and proclaims it, Jesus changes his name. He said, Simon, you've listened to the voice of the Spirit and now your name is Peter, 
the rock, the rock on whom I will build my church. Jesus did it and he does it all through scripture. Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. We talked last week about Jacob to Israel. Two names for one man, a before and after picture in those names. We've got Saul to Paul. You know, God never designed encountering him to be a surface level experience. Like as a fundamental level, when you meet God, you are changed, you are saved. You begin to live the way that you were always made to live. You know, God has created you. He's created every single person in this room. He puts you together with design in mind. But when you meet Him, when you submit yourself to Him, when you give yourself over to Him and you surrender to Him, He begins a formation work in you, a reformation of who you are, of who you were always designed to be. I love what Isaiah 43 says. It says, but now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, who created you, Jacob, who formed you, Israel. This is what the Lord says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. And now if God never breaks out of the sky and says, you who your name is now this, If he never does that to you, if you never feel like you have a rapid name change occurring in your life, you need to know that at a fundamental level, God has revealed what he calls you in this scripture here. He says, I have summoned you by name, you are mine. You are mine, he calls you his. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. What is your name? What is your name? What has God saved you from? What is he saving you to? You know, Philippians says, I I reach out and I take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. There is something that God wants to do in your life that hasn't started yet. And it's important to know who he wants you to be. Maybe you're immersed in a bad workplace, like I said, and it's toxic, but God doesn't call you toxic. He calls you integrous. You know, maybe you've, uh, you know, LinkedIn says you're unemployable. Maybe you can't get a job, but God says, hey, I have a kingdom assignment for you. You know, sometimes you've been called dumb. Sometimes you've been called stupid. But the Word of God says that you have the mind of Christ. When the world tries to rename you, God wants you to remember your name. Because knowing your identity strengthens you. Knowing your identity strengthens you. Have you ever found yourself seeing God so clearly in someone else's situation. And you're just like, when are you gonna come through for me, God? (laughs) Tick tock, (laughs) I can see you doing it for them. When's it gonna be me? When are you gonna come through for me? And, And what I find so fascinating about this story is that the whole thing is like, yeah, it's about like being faithful to God, um, and staying true to Him, but not just for the Hebrews. See, it's easy to consider Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and miss something that is happening outside of the fire, something huge. You see, God's presence in the fire is not just for you. It's not just for you. See, this story of the three men in the fiery furnace is sandwiched between two other stories where the God of heaven is consistently and dramatically revealing himself to King Nebuchadnezzar. Right before this, the king had had a dream which he had found disturbing and he gathers all of the wise men, including Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and Daniel of Lion's Den fame. He calls them all in and he says, hi, you're all dead in a week, unless you can tell me what my dream means. And they're like, absolutely, we can tell you what the dream is, just tell us what the dream is, we'll tell you what it means. And he goes, no, I don't want you to trick me, world's worst boss. I don't want you to trick me. You gotta tell me what the dream was and what it means. So everybody naturally freaks out. And Daniel goes away and he prays to God and he says, God, what is this dream or we're all dead? And he gets the download from God, not only of what the dream is, but what it means, and this is what the dream was. Nebuchadnezzar had dreamt a dream of a gigantic statue. Sound familiar? Giant statue with a head of gold, a belly of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of like iron and clay mixed together. And in his dream, he'd been looking at this statue, wondering what it means, and then, a giant supernatural hand comes out the side of the mountain, knocks down the statue, and the hand 
becomes the king of the world and the hand's kingdom never ends. It's an eternal kingdom. And so what God was trying to say to Nebuchadnezzar is this, hey king, hey king, know who the real king is. Know who the real king is because what this statue represents is that yes, you are a golden head of a golden kingdom, but rapidly inferior kingdoms are going to start to overtake you until I come and wipe the whole thing down and I am the true king and my kingdom is going to be eternal. So get around that, get around a true kingdom that's gonna last. What a dream. So what does Nebuchadnezzar do with this dream? Immediately after, it's like he says, he's like, mm, nah, nah, I won't have it. And so where God has revealed weakness and has humbled him, he patches over inferiority. He policies his way out of reputational risk and he takes control of his future. He takes the idea of a statue and he completely runs with it. And he builds this enormous statue made out of solid gold. You see what he's trying to do? You see what he's trying, I am eternal. I am glorious. No one else is gonna be worshipped here except for me. And Nebuchadnezzar thought that he had fixed his problem, but let's call this out for exactly what it is. I mean, the king is not safeguarding his future against hostile takeovers. He is not mitigating risk. He is not protecting his um, legacy. He's not filling in the gaps where he's missed a few things. The only thing that he is full of is the sin of pride. And we know From the book of James in the Bible, what does it say? It said, God opposes the weak, but gives grace to the prideful. No, it says God opposes the proud, and he gives grace, he lifts up, he gives favor to the humble. And the three men knew this. They know this about God, that he gives grace to the humble, and he will oppose the proud. And so they know this, and they're unafraid, and they refuse to worship anyone else but God. But Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know this yet, so into the fire they go. And we concentrate so much on empathizing with the three in the fire that we forget that this story arc is as much about them as it is about God trying to get through to Nebuchadnezzar. And um, it is a humbling reality, isn't it? To know that God's presence with you in your fire, His comfort, His blessing, His coming through for you is not even maybe about you. Our comfort is almost never God's motivation but revealing his glory always is. You know, Jesus, save us when our pride and our comfort conceals your glory. Holy Spirit, show us where we can be telling people about what you're doing in our life. You see, the fourth man isn't called out by the three men in the fire. They don't say, oh king, do you not see that our faithful God has not abandoned us in this fire? But lo, there are now four of us in the fire. (laughs) Lo, they don't say that. In fact, they're not even the ones to call it out. It's the king who sees the fourth man in the fire. It's the king who says, wait, 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 wait. Didn't we only throw three in? Why am I seeing four? Why are they walking around with their ropes burned off, but they're fine? And here are the first sensible words we see from Nebuchadnezzar in this entire story. And it's his personal revelation that the true God presences himself with those who are humble before him. Finally, the king is beginning to see that God considers humility to be strength. You know, that true humility doesn't roll over for everyone. It doesn't roll over to nation states. It doesn't roll over to pressure. It doesn't roll over to social norms. It doesn't even roll over to inner insecurity. True humility understands its identity and stays standing in that. It bows only to God. True humility is the strength of understanding your identity in God and that's why it's so important to remember your name and remember your identity in God because when you know your identity, you can stand in humility. Identity strengthens you. Humility strengthens you. And God gives grace and favour to the humble. And we see that when the heat is turned up in Nebuchadnezzar's life that some things begin to come out of him almost compulsively. As soon as he's humbled, his pride starts kicking in. As soon as he is um, challenged, he immediately goes into an aggressive stance. And these things that are inside of him begin to come out when the heat is turned up. When the heat is turned up on the three men, literally turned up, they are like what is inside of them begins to come out too their faithfulness, their loyalty, their strength under fire. And this begins to come out of them without them even meaning to. You know, the same pressure brought 
two different outcomes out of two different people. You gotta let the fire do its work. You gotta let the fire do its work. And what is inside of you will come out of you. When heat is applied, impurities rise to the surface. When heat is applied, we begin to react, we begin to change. You know, if you have rotten things in your life, it is only a matter of time until a fire comes along and all of that will be revealed. You know, if I can make a cake and I can be mixing a cake and I can accidentally crack a rotten egg into it and I can be like, oh, I cracked a rotten egg, that's bad, but I've got friends coming over. And I can sit there and I can crack something and there can be something rotten in my mix, but I can, you know, don't we do this with the rotten stuff in our life? We say, you know what, maybe I'll just turn off the lights and then no one will see the rotten stuff. Maybe if I go to a different room and shut the door, no one will see the rotten stuff that's in my life and um, we'll all be good. No one will be, no one will be none the wiser. I have fooled everybody. And we sit there and we think that we can hide this stuff, but the second the heat is turned up, that smell is going to pervade the whole house. You cannot escape it. The heat and the fire is gonna do its work. Proverbs 17 says, it's the crucible for silver and it's the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests. He does this work in the heart. And I said before that God is making you. I said that God is forming you and he wants the best out of you. You know, it doesn't take a lot of heat to get a rise out of me. <laughs> As I was preparing this message, I was astounded every single day, just a little bit of heat, and I was so surprised, and again and again and again, the amount of rotten stuff that was come out from me every morning in the rush of the school morning, in the rush, rush of waking up, and I'm tired, and oh my goodness, I'm so surprised by my own selfishness coming out right now. A little bit of heat has turned up, and oh my goodness, my snappy tone has come out with the kids with a get your bag ready, it's the same thing every day. You know, it's just like a little bit of heat turned up in my life, and oh my goodness, what is that coming out of me? I didn't realize I had it in me to be so conceited. I didn't realize I had it in me to be so lazy. You know, a little bit of traffic can bring out a whole lot of language. A little bit of financial pressure can bring out a whole lot of selfishness. And I know what it is for me, and I know you know what it is for you. And as I've pastored people over the years, it never fails to amaze me that when you turn up the heat, that what comes out of people. It happens every time you, you, you're stretched, you're stepping into a new place in God, a new place in your responsibility in ministry or something like that, you, the heat is turned up and something comes out of them. And it's always amazing, but it's kind of never surprising to see what comes up because you know what, there is like a key link and maybe this will help you to understand what is happening in your own life because there is a key link to who you are and who you have called to be, what God has put inside of you and what gets twisted and distorted by the heat of the fire when it's not fully surrendered to God. When I have a gift of communication, I have a quick mind, I have a quicker mouth. I have a prophetic insight so I can discern and I can see things, I can understand what's going on in people sometimes. And you know what, I can always tell that the heat is on. I, I, one of the first things that tells me, hey, I'm feeling a little bit of heat here is that instead of using my gift of communication and my quick mouth to build up and to edify the church and to speak life, I am using it to dish out the best insults that you have heard all week. I can cut people down so sharp. When I speak and, I, and I'm under pressure and the heat is turned up, and my prophetic insight can be so easily twisted into cutting people down and carving them up and saying, hey, I see this about you and I'm, gonna do, I'm just gonna poke that bruise in you. And you know what? There is like this thing in me. There is goodness, but there is also this badness. And it's like when the heat is turned up, all of that badness gets revealed. You know, if you have the gift of helping, you gotta watch out when the heat is on because you can easily turn your, your gift of helping into a gift of manipulation. You know what? I'm gonna help you get what you really need. What about leaders who have the gift of leadership? When the heat is turned up, you start beginning directing all of that attention, all of that conversation back onto yourself. 
When the heat is turned up and you have the gift of evangelism, instead of promoting God, instead of promoting Jesus, instead of showing everybody where he is, you're showing everybody where you are. You're, show, you're talking about yourself all the time. You gotta watch when your heat is turned up in your life. And don't the words of the Apostle Paul hit home here? I wanna do good. I wanna have goodness come out of me. But where right alongside the good, there's this evil. I mean, who is gonna save me from myself? Nebuchadnezzar was feeling the heat and we can learn from him. You know, we do the same thing he did, maybe not in like such a spectacular way, but you know, we go, oh, there's some badness in me. I better start, you know, building myself up. I'm gonna attempt mindfulness. I started coloring books. So dumb. All right. You know, we go on retreats, we start exercising to release a bit of steam because I'm feeling some heat and you know what? You just cannot build a golden statue and expect to make yourself better. You can't. Well, Jesus says, if you follow me, I'll make you. I'll build you. Don't worry about it. I'll do it for you. You just need to follow me. Galatians 5 says that we are to live under the power and the words of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of a life lived like that, of fruit in your life like that, is that what is rotten in you, all of that badness, the evil, the sin in you gets replaced by spiritual fruit. It gets replaced by spiritual qualities that stand the test of the fire. You know, when the heat is turned up in my home in the morning, I, I'm saying, God, you've shown me how selfish I am. Would you release in me that sweetened smell of kindness? Holy Spirit, would you do a work in me so that when the heat is turned up and the kids are dragging their feet and they're running in the house for the 17th time today and I've yelled at them 17 times, the sweet aroma of patience, of goodness, of gentleness. Maybe you're a manager here and you've got a dumb employee they just don't get it. And you sit there and you're just like, for the last time, wouldn't it let the Holy Spirit do a work in you? His power overtaking your impatience and bringing self-control into that situation. You gotta let the Spirit do His work in you. You gotta submit and surrender to Him. You gotta let His fire bring to the surface any impurity in you. You gotta embrace with humility what He is showing you. He says, this, this thing, I turn up the heat and this is what's coming out. I want it to be holy. I don't want it to stay that way. You know, Charles Spurgeon once said, I love this quote, he says, I have learned to kiss the wave that slams me into the rock of ages. And I couldn't agree more. You know what, as a Christian, you begin to bless the fires that you walk through. You say, yes, I'm seeing what you're doing, Holy Spirit. I see See what you're doing in me and I embrace it, I love it. For a Christian, the fire is just another place to surrender to God and keep all of the attention on Him. You know, if you're in the fire, if you're not in the fire, we still have the Spirit with us. And just like the three men, you can walk out of your fire and not smell like smoke. As you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author of your name, the perfecter and the refiner of your faith, you can be strengthened by knowing who you are. You can be strengthened by your humble focus on God and you can be strengthened when God purifies you. This was illustrated to me in a beautiful way this week. I caught up with a really talented interior designer here in our church. I sat across the table from her over a matcha latte and uh, we sat there and um, we, we caught up and I hadn't caught up with her in so long and I was so pleased to hear that her business had grown to a point where all these clients had come in, God had brought all of these accounts to her and she was finally able to leave the insanely toxic workplace that she was a part of. I was so happy for her. I was so excited for her. I said, I can't even believe you stayed there that long. And she goes, I know, right, it was awful. And so she begins to tell me about this workplace. But do you know what the craziest part of this was? That as she's telling me, she goes, you know what, it was so bad. This was happening, this was happening, this dodgy thing was happening. She said, I just didn't know what else to do. I would pray the entire way on my commute to work. I'd be putting worship music on. I said, these people sound like animals. And she goes, you know what, they just don't respect themselves. They certainly don't respect God. And you know what, she's sitting there and she'd been immersed in a toxic place 
But all I could sense from her was sweetness. All I could sense from her was love and of peace and of like a dependency and a confidence in God. I'm like, how did you stay there for so long? And she goes, well, you know, I know God always comes through. And I'm like, yeah, I know, we sing about it all the time. And she goes, no, like He really comes through for me and I knew that He would again. And I was like, yeah, 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 we, like we all know, but how did you stay? How did you stay and keep your integrity like this? How did you stay and not be bad mouthing these people? How do you stay and have your heart so secure in what God was wanting to do? And she goes, look, you're not gonna get it unless I tell you my story. And so she proceeds to tell me that when she was a little girl, debt collectors come knocking on her door and begin taking their stuff from their family house for a debt that wasn't hers. And she would hide from them She would wait till they were gone from the house before she went home to get her stuff. When she finished high school, it was decided that it would be safer for her to do university in Australia than to be sold to the collectors. And so she came to Australia to complete university. But when she got to the airport, there was no taxi. And then when she got to the university, there was nobody to meet her. And when she got to her room, there was nobody there to help her carry her bags, her really heavy bags with all her stuff like up three flights of stairs. When she got into her room, she was so, so hungry and Perth was closed. And uh, she, she's like, I don't know where to go. I don't have a car. I don't know anybody here. I don't know a soul. And the heat of all of those situations could easily have threatened to buckle her faith in God. They could easily have threatened her faith in God. But for so many people, um, this happens and it happened to her that when the heat was turned up, her faith in God was clarified, it was strengthened, it was purified. At every single turn, she turned to God, she turned to her helper and said, God, help me get to Australia. She turned to God and said, God, help me get to the university. And a taxi pulls up. She says, God, help me, they've all left for the day and a worker comes back to open up and to get her settled into her home. She sits there at the bottom of the stairs and she said, God, help me. My bags are too heavy to climb up the stairs. And someone walks past her, gets halfway up, turns around and says, do you need a hand carrying your bags? She sits in her room as a young woman in a foreign country, nothing to eat, nowhere to go, nowhere to get there. And she says, God, tell somebody I'm hungry. Tell somebody I need dinner and a knock on the door happens about 20 minutes later. Hey, I'm gonna go get some food. Do you wanna come with me and my friends in our car to go get some dinner? And she finds herself in a car full of Christians who she ends up churching with, living with. She gets a job, she does an honours program, she starts this business. And I look at her and I think, no wonder you were so calm in the fire. No wonder you were able to be so resilient in the fire. Every single time you have cried out to God, He has met you, He has answered you, He has come alongside you, He has made a way for you. No wonder you can be like that. You know, the three men in the fire had been threatened by death from Nebuchadnezzar several times before and every time before God had come through for them and they knew that God would come through for them again. And we treat the fourth man in the fire like it's such a rare occurrence, like, oh, you know it's really bad when God shows up. You know it's really bad if He has to do a miracle healing. But for a Christian, that's meant to be our daily reality. That's meant to be our daily, that God is right alongside us in our trials, right with us in the fire. You know, if you're a Christian in here and you're surprised when God comes through for you, even in the small stuff, you need a realignment in your faith. You need, you've need you called yourself forgotten and God has called you um, chosen. You know, He says, I've never taken my eyes off you. He's, you say, I'm unimportant, my stuff doesn't matter to you. And His presence reminds you, you're mine, I've never taken my eye off you. When you pass through the fire, I'm not gonna leave you. When you pass through the flames, you're not gonna get burned. And when I consider all my brothers and sisters all over the world, and maybe you're in a nation like this right now where you're being persecuted for your faith, I'm reminded that even death cannot kill those who know Jesus Christ. Because the very moment that we leave the presence of this world, when our breath becomes air, when we leave this world, we become face to face with the living God. We're right there in His presence, the God who has treasured you, the God who has called you by name, the God who has guided you, protected you, provided for you. No matter what the heat of your fire is, no matter what the ferocity of what it is that you're facing by, even if it's death, His presence is your strength. His presence is your strength. 
And God will strengthen you, yes, by giving you a name, by humbling you, by purifying you, but He will strengthen you by being present with you. And it's not for the special occasions, it's for the every day. And I have good news today. And that good news is this, that you were not made to walk in weakness. You were not made to walk alone. You were not made for a life where it's just a continual series of covering up the latest thing that you found was wrong with yourself. You were not made for that. The good news is that Jesus Christ lived. He died. He rose again from the dead so that you could be free to know who you really are, so that you could be free to know who He really is. You know, He, God loves you. He has called you by name. He is never gonna leave you. He's never gonna forget get you. And if you've come to church today and you're tired of living a life where all you seem to do is paper over the cracks, you know, maybe the self-promotion is starting to wear a little bit thin and you're feeling fake and you're just tired of it. Maybe you came to church today and you have questions about your life, about your relationship, about your situations and you just don't know what to do. I can tell you that I don't know the ins and outs of your situation, but I do know the God who wants to be present right in the middle of your situation. So right across this room and online, how about you close your eyes? You can bow your heads as an act of humility. And this moment is for us to be real between God and ourselves. This moment is the moment where no one else can see what's in the heart except for you and for God. It's a place where you can be completely transparent, completely open. And today I wanna ask you this question so that you can reflect. I want you to know, and I want you to ask the question of yourself, is Jesus in my life? And if you are a believer, if you know Jesus already, I want you to think of the situations that are coming to mind and say, God, where are you in this? Reveal yourself to me in this situation. And then for those in the room who do not know Jesus yet, but you're done living a life that has no power, you're done living a life that feels weakened, you're done living a life questioning who you are, I wanna give you an opportunity to begin walking with Jesus. Because walking with Jesus, you're gonna find out who you are, you're gonna find out what you're living for, and you're gonna find out who He is. And He loves you, He'll never leave you. He'll strengthen you with His mighty power, He'll give you the Holy Spirit. So if you wanna receive Jesus today, for those in the room and for those online who don't know Jesus yet, what's gonna happen is this. I'm gonna pray a pair, and we're all gonna pray it together, line by line, and I'll lead us in that. Because the Bible says that receiving Jesus is not about doing a song and dance. It's not about getting good enough first. It's just about believing that He is God in your heart and accepting Him with the words of your mouth. And so a prayer is simply that. It's saying, God, I want You to be my God. I want to begin living with You. So what we're gonna do, church, right across the room, and you can pray this out loud online as well. I'm gonna say a line by line and we're all gonna say it together. Are you ready? All right, Jesus, I'm praying to You today that I need You in my life. I'm done living my own way. I wanna live in step with You. Give me Your salvation. Give me Your Holy Spirit so I can know You and love You like You know me and You love me. I accept You as God today. Walk with me every day. From now on, Amen. Amen. Let's give a hand to people in the room and to people online who have made that decision to walk with Jesus.